Hi, Josh from Porter Square Books coming to you today from my fiction section. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking a little bit about book clubs. Um, book clubs are great ways to use literature and books and reading to build community, explore challenging ideas or emotions or images in the safe context of the books, socialize, have fun, structure your wine drinking, um, hopefully have really rewarding um, group uh, and communal experiences uh, through the power of the written word. Um, book clubs are also um, relatively easy to both start and transfer online. Um, there are a number of different really good um, virtual digital um, meeting softwares that you can use. I'm not going to recommend one of them in particular. You are intelligent people. You can find one on your own. Uh, so book clubs are great ways to get a little uh, society in your life while you are socially distant. Um, so today I'm going to share a few things um, that will help you deepen your reading and have lead, lead to better and more richer and deeper book club conversations, um, really making you the superstar of your book club, assuming, of course, you're the only one who watches this video, uh, which I'm going to assume for now. Um, I've got a couple perspectives, um, some very um, practical tips, and some questions that you can ask while you're reading and as part of your discussion that will kind of lead to all of this um, kind of enhanced um, and richer reading and discussions. Ready? You don't have a choice. Great. So I'm going to start off with a perspective first, and that is this. It's intentional. Uh, Jenny Offel, author of the beloved novel The Department of Speculation, was recently on um, tour with for her new book, Weather, and uh, someone stepped up to the microphone during the question and answer session and started to ask the question, you know, Ms. Awful, did you intend? And she cut them off and said, yes, I did. It is better, it, reading is much richer if you assume that what you are seeing, what you are finding meaning of in the book is intentional, is part of the author's goals and hopes for the text. And there are two reasons why that is. Um, first, you can't really know an author's intentions. I mean, they're not there while you're reading. You're not in their brain. They're not in your brain. So you can't really have an answer to that question. And even if you were at an event with them and could pose the question, Ms. Awful, did you intend? It doesn't mean they have to tell you the truth. They can tell you whatever they think is going to make the book seem better in your eyes, which is probably going to be, it's intentional. Um, furthermore, um, if you're at a reading with an author, odds are, it's been months, maybe even years, since they've interacted with whatever it is you are asking about. So there is a good chance they might not remember. And there's a, also a good chance they didn't have anything in particular in mind at that moment. So because there's really no way to come to a satisfying answer, there really isn't a way you can use evidence in the text to figure it out, it's not really a productive question. Um, the second reason is that um, all books to date um, have been written by human beings, humans with um, unexamined biases, uh, unconscious biases, unexamined assumptions, hang-ups, flaws, gaps in their memory, um, all the weaknesses that all human beings have. And even though books are a great way to kind of, and the process of writing books is a great way to kind of pull the, your, your brilliance, your genius, your empathy, your creativity, um, your, your talent kind of out of your brain into something that is public that other people can experience, some of your, you're still just a brain doing it. You're still just a single human um, putting this work out. And so those limitations, those flaws, those mistakes will come along with it because ultimately, once a book is written, it's just the work of a single brain doing their best to tell a story that's important to him, to them. Or it's a single brain until you read it. And then it's two brains. And you don't have just one imagination finding meaning in whatever the words are. You have two or three or four or five, depending on how many members of your book club there are. Um, in a way, a book isn't a book. It isn't finished until you read it. You are essentially a co-author by finding the meaning that's in it as you read. In a kind of quantum entanglement kind of way, if you see something in the book, it is supposed to be there. It was always there for you to see. 
and it was always there for you to see because you saw it. Um, the one note about um, this idea, asterisk, uh, Kurt Vonnegut fans will know why I've chosen to write the word asterisk out and not just have a big asterisk sitting right here on this slide. Um, there is another style of reading called deconstruction, which is essentially the mirror image of the type of reading I've just described for you. It essentially assumes the author has no control whatsoever on the meaning that happens in the book and can often actually um, write, create things that are opposed to what seems to be their intention. I actually think deconstruction can be a lot of fun. You can get a lot out of reading books this way. You can learn a lot about narrative and literature and assumptions and especially language, but just not the type of reading I'm talking about today. And frankly, it's not a type of reading I do enough in my daily life that I'd feel comfortable giving you uh, a slide-filled uh, presentation um, about it here today. Um, so the next thing I'm going to share with you is something very practical. Get a reading notebook. It doesn't have to be, you know, fancy hardcover with like one of those bookmarks in it um, journal, um, but I often buy fancy notebooks when I'm sad, and so I can't begrudge anybody else if they have a whole bunch of fancy notebooks sitting around. Um, but it doesn't have to be a fancy notebook. It can be a cheap notebook. It can be your phone. It can be scraps of paper that you kind of paper clip together. Whatever it is, as long as it is something that is keeps your observations all in one place and keeps them with the book while you are reading. There are kind of two and a half reasons why it's really important to get a reading notebook. The first, you know that brilliant observation you just had about the book that it's just gonna totally blow the minds of every member of your book club? You will not remember it by the time book club actually meets in two weeks. You, you just won't. The human brain and human memory just doesn't work like that. This is something that writers kind of always discover uh, that first time they assume they're going to remember that great idea, and then as soon as they get home to write it down, it is completely gone, and it was never coming back. I suppose there are, so, so you won't remember it, I promise you, um, unless you are in your book club right now, at which point it's kind of rude to be watching this video, but I do appreciate your attention. Um, and I, I assume, you know, there are, there's a lot of diversity in how human brains work. And so there are probably some of you out there who do remember your brilliant observations and don't have to write them down. Um, I think the journal is still useful, um, and I hope you only use your powers for good. Um, the second reason why uh, you really can benefit from having a reading journal is um, one of the joys of reading a book, especially novels, uh, but really anything book length, is watching um, things that are one way at the beginning go through a series of changes to become another thing at the end. Watching a character develop, watching an image change, watching this plot develop, watching this theme get uh, rehashed and remixed and retransferred to something new. It is a lot easier to appreciate that process of transformation once you've gotten to the end if you can refer back to the beginning. If you know where character A started and can see where character A started, it's a lot easier to appreciate why it's important that char where character A and or image A or theme A or whatever. Having your earlier notes while you read later text is such a is such a huge um, boon to your reading because you really get to enjoy some of the um, most impactful and impressive things about a work of fiction or a long work in general. Um, the two and a half, um, I don't know if this is just me. I don't think it's just me, uh, but it might be. Um, often when you commit to writing down your observations about a book, you suddenly have more observations about a book. You start thinking in terms of what you want to write down. It's like you trick your brain by giving it a homework assignment that it has to do because it wants to get an A, right? Everyone's brain wants to get an A. And so the simple act of committing to writing down what you think and what you observe will help you become, at least in this small context, more observant and more thoughtful. 
Um, now, if you haven't kept a journal before, if you aren't familiar with um, writing down your notes or your thoughts uh, while you're reading, I have one quick tip. Notice things that repeat. Um, repeating details are the author's way of telling you that these things are connected. Um, in some ways, it's a, almost a shorthand or a shortcut. Um, so if you see, it's uh, like the author has given you a scaffold of these repeating details and you build your own meaning on top of it. So you see this thing happened here, this thing happened here, this thing happened here, this thing happened here, um, and you tend to be the one that tops that with whatever is significant. Um, there are a number of easy things to look for while you're trying to keep track of things that repeat. Colors. Colors are very common, um, commonly used by authors to stitch themes and ideas together. Landscapes. Um, so, are these things taking place in rivers? Are they? Are there lakes in the background? Is there a clip art mountain somewhere? Um, you know, does does a character always talk about certain landscapes? Similarly, but a little different. Um, places. What happens at the cafe? Do certain conversations only happen at the cafe? Do certain conversations only happen at the town center? Is someone always talking about Paris or their kitchen or remembering a forest from their childhood? So colors, landscapes, and places are great ways to kind of notice when an author is signaling to you that something, that these two things are connected. Uh, so this is going to be, the next thing is going to be the first question that I want you to ask while you're reading or that you can ask of your book club at the meeting. First, first question, who is the narrator? Sometimes this is an easy question. Uh, the narrator uh, will often tell you who they are, though they're not always 100% truthful about that, and sometimes they're actually 100% untruthful. Um, sometimes that is the central mystery of this, the book, and part of the joy and the fun of the book is using the details you experience as you go along to figure out and solve that puzzle. Um, sometimes you need to get a little more creative to answer this question. A quick example, um, anyone who follows Fortescue books knows how much I love the novel Duck's New Report. Look, you can all see my tattoo. Um, in Duck's New Report, there are two kind of currents. There is a current that's in the mind of a mountain lion, and there's a current that's in the mind of a woman who is a mother, and she's running a small baking business out of her home kitchen. Um, now, the mother can't know the mind of the mountain lion, and the, the mountain lion can't really also know the mind of the woman. So that means there has to be a third entity that is capable of looking into the mind of the woman and the mind of the mountain lion, and that third entity is the narrator of Duck's New Report. Now, I have some suspicions about who that narrator really is, but I don't have any really satisfying answers that I'd like to share um, with you as well. Um, one other kind of note about this question, um, sometimes the answer will feel like it's God. We all remember back from our sophomore English class, the third person omniscient. Um, sometimes the answer also really feels like, oh, it's, it's the author, it's, it's Lucy Ellman. Um, keep pushing on that a little bit. Um, that might be correct. Lots of books are written in third-person omniscient, where the narrator is God. Lots of books are written in third-person omniscient, where the narrator is, in fact, the author. Um, but it'll be really interesting. You'll have a much more interesting discussion if you start to if you start by trying to find someone else, um, a different entity that isn't one of those two things. Um, also, there are a lot of stories and books that actually support the idea of multiple different narrators. Uh, not books that are just written in different voices, but books that have po different possible answers. Um, and so one of you in your book club could, could, be, could, could believe the narrator is this one entity, and another could believe this narrator is another entity. And there's the evidence in the book to support both cases, and that is great. Because book clubs are better when there's occasional, uh, maybe even frequent, disagreements. Because it's from the conflicts over narrator A versus narrator B that you can really get at the essence of both the book and some of your own personal assumptions about what it means to read and what you get out of reading. 
Um, once you've come to some kind of conclusion about who the narrator is, the next question you can ask is, why are they telling their story? All narrators have motivation. There is something at stake for every narrator who is telling their story. Uh, even um, reliable narrators, there will be something, there will be some reason why they are narrating this story. And even if they are trustworthy in telling the events and the thoughts and their experiences of, of their story, that doesn't mean they've been open and honest about their motivation for telling their story. A uh, quick example uh, about this, about how, about how one book answered this question. Um, it's a wonderful book called Samuel Johnson's Eternal Return. Uh, by Martin Riker. It's a great book club book, tons to discuss. I highly recommend it if you're in need of a book club book. Now, what's interesting, so it's a first person limited narrator, and uh, we actually get the narrator's motivation at the very end, as in like last page-ish of the novel, the narrator tells you why he is telling this story. And I believe him. There's reason to trust him in this one. But what happens then is that reverberates all the way back. And you can, once you finish the book and have that answer, you can read it now in an entirely different way. It's a fascinating read, and it's a great example of how the motivations of the narrator impact what we've read and why and what we get out of it. Kind of a next step up from what the, or out or around, um, from what the narrator's motivations are. The next question is, out of all the possible stories in the world, why write this one? There are an infinite number of stories there can tell. We can tell. There's an infinite number of ways we can put words together to create what we consider a story. So why did the author choose this one? Why was it this story, the one they put all of the hard work in to make into a book to give to you, for you to give it two and a half stars on a rating site? Um, there is a chance that the answer to this question is, it's all that they can think of. And as true as that might be, I would assume that's not true. Kind of going back to assuming it's intentional, assuming they had a grander motivation or, or a more specific motivation just makes the reading of it a little bit easier. Um, this is another one of those things that's, that's just me, and this one might be just me. Um, sometimes I'll be reading a book and I'll come across a sentence or a, a scene or you know a passage or something that is just... It's just stupid. It's, it's ridiculous. It's, it's banal. It's mundane. It doesn't have any place in a work of fiction, except I don't notice that right away. In the moment of reading it, it feels beautiful or profound or, or it's, it's compelling or, or you know, I have emotions uh, in, in, in response to it. And it's only later, after I've had some critical distance, uh, maybe I'm rereading it, maybe I'm just thinking about it, Later, maybe I'm talking about it, and I'll think to myself, that was really stupid, except the context that surrounded it made it brilliant. And the context is, of course, the entire book. So there is a part of me that wonders if the author just had this stupid idea that they love. And we all have that, right? That just, it's just, it's dumb. You know, it's, it's our food truck idea. You know, it's, it's, our, it's our scuba diving, bed and breakfast, flight of fancy business idea in the Cayman Isles. Whatever it is, it is stupid, but we love it. It's important to us, and that's great. And authors must have that, too. And so I always wonder, it, did they just need to get this into the world? And the only way this stupid thing that they love could get into the world is if they surrounded it by a book. So those are the questions. Um, I'm now going to come back to one kind of particular, one thing that's kind of like a mixture of a particular, of a technique and a perspective. Now, if you are, have zoned out the entire time and are just kind of tuning in right now, great. This is the most important slide. This is the most important idea in this entire presentation. Are you ready? Doesn't matter because you can't stop me anyway. Listen to your own brain. Our brains process a lot more information than is always available in our conscious thinking. And we know this, right? We have a bad feeling about a person or about a room, or you have, uh, there's just something, you have a hunch, you have intuition. We have all these terms for these, the fact that we don't often have access to all of the information that our brains actually have. And reading is no different. 
you remember more than you think you remember. There is more of that book you're reading in your head than maybe you can access at any given time. And your brain will give you signals for that. Um, for me personally, it sounds like, huh. Like it sounds like me saying, huh. Or it will sound like the kind of sound I assume a check mark makes. I'm not entirely sure what the automatopoeia for that would be, but that's what it sounds like for me. And uh, so what it sounds like in your brain will be entirely different, I assume. But the important thing is, when that happens, write it down. Even if it's just a check mark or huh. Uh, there's a reason why your brain flagged that moment for you, even if the language conscious part of the brain that talks to itself isn't able to access why at that moment. Um, I said that was the most important slide. Actually, actually, this is the most important slide. So if you've really been tuning in and out, here is your moment. Trust yourself. Trust yourself. If you hear huh, if you hear check mark, if you think something is there, something is there. And I know this because you are a better reader than you think you are. I don't care what you, that you got a C- on, one of the, on that paper your sophomore year in high school. I don't care how disdainfully your professor reacted when you hadn't heard of his favorite poet. You are a better reader than you think you are. Humans are communicating animals. We are language, specifically language communicating animals. We are entire societies, all of our personal lives are in some ways built around the idea of communicating with each other through many things, including words. And if you are literate, if you know how to read, if you have read a book, all of those inherent evolved communication and interpretation skills follow you from the world into your reading life. You are a better reader than you think you are. If you can read, you're actually probably a pretty good reader because humans are actually really good at interpreting communications from other human beings. So I implore you, while you're listening to your brain, trust yourself. Because once again, you are a better reader than you think you are. So I'll just do a quick recap for you. Um, we talked about some perspectives, some questions, some very practical things. Um, first of all, assume that what, you, that what you're reading is intentional, that the author meant it. Get yourself a reading notebook. Can be fancy, doesn't have to be. Maybe make it fancy. These are dark times. Notice things that repeat, like colors, places, landscapes. Ask yourself, who is the narrator? And, and pose challenging, make this a challenge for yourself. Don't just accept the first answer that comes to mind. Once you've got your narrator, Ask, why are they telling the story? And once you've got a handle on that, go one step further and ask, out of all the possible stories in the world, why did the author tell this one? And while you're asking and answering and reading these questions, listen to your own brain, trust yourself, because you are a better reader than you think you are. So thank you all again. I hope you get something out of this. I hope your book clubs get something out of this. Um, thank you all so much for the support you have shown Porter Square Books over these strange and socially distant times that don't seem to have a set end at the moment. Um, we'll see you very soon in some other form online, and we hope to see you um, much sooner um, at the store again. Thank you all so much.